Now, in this video, we're going to go through the necessary settings and connections to use the MPC Renaissance in standalone mode with your computer. Now, the first thing you want to do is go up to the MPC drop down menu and get your preferences. Make sure your audio is set up so that you can actually hear playback. And let's go into our MIDI devices. Now, I want to make sure my USB keyboard is set up. And of course, any other drivers you may have for your system. And then right here, you can assign your MIDI output ports. The MPC Renaissance has four MIDI out ports on the back of the unit. Okay, and these can be set up to either send MIDI over MIDI cables to any rack hardware units you may have, but it also can be used internally, and you can use these to send to any other software synth that may be running in tandem. This would allow you to maybe sync them in time, or even just have it triggering other synth sounds. The next thing you want to do is make sure that our plugins are all working and loaded properly. So make sure you highlight any of the folders here and assign them here. If they're not checked, they won't scan. Now at this point, MPC Renaissance does not support VST3 plugins, only standard VSTIs. Scan everything. Now one of the great new updates in 1.7 is that plugin scanning is actually happening outside the program, both as a standalone and inside your DAW of choice. Now what this means is that if any of the plugins crash while you're trying to load them, they don't crash the software, and they don't crash the plugin, which would then crash the DAW software, which would basically crash Pro Tools or Logic or anything else you're using. Now, if you want to adjust the pad sensitivity or any of the controls on your MPC Renaissance, you would do it from here. Pad threshold is going to be the minimum amount of touch it requires to play a sample at the lowest level. So think about this like a noise gate. Anything beneath a certain threshold, your pad threshold, would be filtered out and not audible. Of course, anything above the threshold would be allowed through. Now, what this means is, is that if you go ahead and touch a pad, and if you just lightly graze it after you've touched it, this will either be counted as aftertouch, or if your threshold is enough, it won't. Or let's say you accidentally double tap a pad, this threshold is going to eliminate that. So for new people and people who aren't used to actually drumming on the MPC pads, it might be a good choice to go ahead and raise the pad threshold a little bit to make sure that you're not double tapping and having flammed samples playback. Now, if you're an experienced hand drummer and maybe you've owned an MPC in the past, you might wanna bring this pad threshold down to its lowest possible number like I have down at one and I'll let everything through because the truth of this is you could always go up into the edit window inside the MPC software and just remove any extra data that you didn't really want recorded. The benefit of course being that now you get to record all the ghost notes and that really gives a drum pattern its flavor. Not having everything, what we call machine gun, gu -gu 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 the same over and over and over again. Having some flexibility between your dynamics and volume is what's going to make this sound a little bit more like a real drummer. And you can actually emulate swing by bringing down the volume of notes in front of other notes. So instead of having something like pop pop, you could then have it like pop pop. And that's the way that a real drummer would play. Specifically on a kick drum, they might dust the first note and then put all of their strength into the second. Now, of course, if you don't feel comfortable doing it that way, you could always just keep full level on and you can program the pads in as you feel comfortable playing them. And then, of course, go into the MPC software in the edit window and grab the velocity handle for each MIDI note to fine tune how loud you want it to play. Okay, and there's a double lesson here because if you happen to have, say, a multi-level sample, meaning that you've loaded in up to four different velocity layer samples to create one pad performance, the velocity with which you strike the pad with your finger will determine which sample is played back. Okay, now this actually leads us into pad sensitivity. Pad sensitivity, of course, is going to be how light you can touch the pad to get each dynamic response or what velocity it comes out as, meaning that you could, of course, just raise the sensitivity if you want to play the drum really light but you still want it to read full level, or the opposite, of course. If you've got big hands and you like to hit it really hard, you could turn the sensitivity down, like I have, and it'll take more of a hit to reach 127. Now, I kind of like this actual setup because I like to really give the MPC a good whack on the pad and make that be full level. The other option, of course, being if I want full level, I'm going to use the full level button. So having that kind of mid-range area where you can hit, say, 80 on the velocity scale or 90 or whatever, this can be really important because the truth of this is there's always going to be a part of the song that needs to get bigger. And if you've maxed out the sample, especially if you're using a multi-layer sample, 
then it can't get bigger because if you're hitting 127 every time, then it's going to play the exact same sample every time. So especially if you're doing like a snare roll or something quick like that, you will kind of want to ramp it up. You want to run through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 100, and then have like the last couple hit 127, not 127 the entire time. Then, of course, you have pad curve. Now, pad curve, basically, if we were imagining a linear graph, would be if I grabbed the straight line and made it either more convex or concave. The reason is, if I play along this curve, I want to adjust the notes louder or softer based on the sensitivity of my playing ability. I know this sounds confusing, so there's going to be some trial and error here. And the best thing that you're going to do is watch the pad response and touch the pad and feel how the graphic changes and how deep you have to push and get an idea if this is how you like to play. Then pull up a kick and a snare and play around with it. See if you can make full level happen, which is 127 on the velocity, and then see if you can actually tap in half level or three quarters level or maybe even one quarter level. See how fast you can build it up just using the velocity of your hand, the dynamics of your playing, and not programming it. Because I guarantee if you learn how to play this more like a hand drum, like a bongo, conga, or something, you're going to become a much better programmer. So just go through all the different pad curve types until you find the one that connects with you. Now one last tip before we move to the next video. To make use of all of the hardware of the MPC Renaissance, and by that I mean the vinyl RCA input, the line input, the mic input, or even the volume out, the MPC either needs to be running in standalone mode and be properly set up in either your PC or Mac, or it has to be selected as the audio device inside your DAW. What this means is, once inside your DAW, you want to pick the MPC Renaissance as your audio in-out converter and main sound card. What this also means is, if you are not using it as your audio interface, then you cannot use and sample vinyl inbound using the inputs, you cannot connect a USB MIDI keyboard to it and activate plugins. It can only function as a playback device with which your already programmed sequences and songs can play back and we can render down as audio. So the general workflow we want to do is standalone mode first because it just works. And when we're ready, we're going to print out a track, which will be our rough mix. That way we would deliver to a lead vocalist so they can practice and sing over. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and bounce everything down into our DAW as audio, and then record the vocals to that in my mix session. In the next video, we're going to cover browsing and loading of samples, drum kits, sequences, and songs, and then we're going to dive in and actually start making the beat.